Hello, everyone. My name is Pastor Melvin Miller, and I uh, just want to welcome you tonight uh, to this, uh, this annual summit. Uh, we couldn't be more delighted to have you out here tonight. Come on, give yourselves a hand for coming out to be a part of this amazing, amazing event. I don't know if you've uh, ever been in Progressive, or if you know any, I don't know if you know anything about Progressive, but we really try to be engaged uh, in addressing the challenges that face our city. Uh, we have uh, uh, one of the largest food shelves on the east side, job fairs, a, a number of uh, community engagement events. We've had some significant forums here. We're part of the uh, selection process for the uh, chief of police uh, here in St. Paul, and uh, we're proud of all of that. But we're particularly proud to have this event here tonight. So once again, welcome and thank you for coming. Good evening and welcome again for being here this evening. My name is Jesse Kingston. I am the director for the Department of Human Rights and Equal Economic Opportunity. And we are the department which the Police Civilian Internal Affairs Review Commission is housed in now, effective February of this year. And I am thrilled that you guys are here to hear about all of the changes that have been made and to meet your commissioners and learn and share your thoughts and your feedback. Before we begin, if this wants to work, Okay. It went. Oh, now it really went. Yeah. <laughs> Frozen in time. And it's not even that cold out. I mean, how exciting is that? That it is November, it is after Thanksgiving, and we got to get here not in a snowstorm. I'm thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> I do like the snow. It's one of the reasons why I live in Minnesota. I'm not a hot weather kind of a person. I want to start by just a couple of housekeeping rules. We are videotaping this event tonight, so I would ask that you please silence your phones. If you have not been to Progressive Church before, the restrooms are right outside the hall on the right side. We do have some staff here who can help direct you if you need them. There are food and beverages out uh, in the left side of in the outside the sanctuary you are welcome to step out enjoy the food and beverages we would ask that you do not bring them here into the sanctuary we're going to go through uh, quite a bit of things tonight uh, before we go through the agenda i do want to thank progressive baptist church for hosting us and our other community partners the saint paul naacp the saint paul black interdenominational ministerial alliance the african-american leadership council and the saint paul police department for hosting this event tonight and putting it on i also want to give a special thanks to council president stark who has joined us as well who um, is one of the council members that supported the changes that were made to our Police Civilian Internal Affairs Review Commission ordinance. Um, there are bright lights coming down at me, so if I'm missing any elected official, I just can't see you, and I would just ask if you would stand up and please introduce yourself. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, I want to thank, in particular, all of you who are in this room and who have been on this journey with the city. And in particular, attending our community meetings that were led in partnership with the University of Minnesota Center for Restorative Justice and Peacemaking. There were a number of community meetings that gathered feedback as well as public hearings that led to some significant changes. So thank you all for participating and continuing to engage in this conversation and the dialogue and the work that we are doing. As I mentioned, the end of February, specifically February 25th, 2017, our new Police Civilian Internal Affairs Review Ordinance went into effect. We knew that we would be building processes from the ground up while continuing to drive a fully functional car. These are things that keep driving every single day and we are making changes. 
This takes time and planning and attention to detail and a lot of change management. This started many, many, many months before the ordinance actually went into effect. But since that time, we have created and implemented a strong complaint intake process. We built a better experience for complainants by including regular communications, a transparent testimony process, and new and accessible ways to file a complaint, including both online and in multiple languages. We've worked closely with the St. Paul Police Department, Labor Relations, our city attorney's office, and the mayor's office to develop standard operating procedures so that our work is not only repeatable, but predictable to the community, and that nothing falls through the cracks. We've also appointed eight new civilian commissioners who you're gonna have the opportunity to meet tonight. And when I say you're gonna have the opportunity to meet tonight, they're not just gonna come up here and give their name and everyone walks away. You're gonna be able to have table conversations and get to know them and we wanna hear from you and hear your feedback. These new civilian commissioners have been trained more than 40 hours, which is more than any board and commission that we have in the city that receives training. And they will continue to receive training to ensure that the work that they are doing is meeting what we need them to do. Our new commissioners have already begun to conduct uh, case reviews and do deliberations. It's been a really busy year. A lot of work has been done and we're really excited to share that with you this evening. And now, it is with great pleasure that I am going to turn this over to Diane Benz, who is the St. Paul NAACP president and a former PCR commissioner, and she's gonna give a little background further on how we got here this evening. So thank you, Diane. Thank you. When the lights are bright, but first off, I'd like to thank everybody that I see out here. I have been coming to these for the last 20 years. And give yourself a hand because this is the largest audience that I've ever seen before. And it makes me so happy to see that there are citizens out here that have an interest in the complaint process and how it's working because there was once upon a time, I'm gonna talk about how we got here. We got here because this commission was really created, the original commission in 1994, but we didn't have any input into it. We didn't even know how it ran. The community didn't have no trust in it. And most folks didn't even file complaints. And then I would have to say that under the direction of Nathaniel Kalik, I have to give him his props, he said, we got to do something. And so we went to Minneapolis and other places, and people really weren't interested in talking about having a mediated agreement. But Nick kept pushing us, because I was there. I was there when the agreement was signed. Chief Finney was the chief then. And it made me very happy that we got the agreement signed. And that agreement is what help to bring about the changes that we have today. These very changes that we talked about that we worked to get passed in December of last year that took place now, where we don't have, because what, in order to get that agreement passed, we had to agree to have two positions that belong to the Fe Police Federation on the commission. It was seven members at the time. And when uh, I came on to the commission, I spent the biggest of my time fighting with those two officers from the Federation. And so I kept saying, they got to go. <laughs> this ain't working. They have got to go. So we worked to make sure that they went. And thank God that they did. And I believe that truly you have a civilian uh, review process now that the community can have trust in, can have faith in irregardless of who the police chief is. And that's what we needed to have because we have had good police chiefs. I gotta give, I gotta give St. Paul that. You did some good selection of chiefs because we've been able to work with them on issues and I wouldn't take anybody. I don't think there's nobody greater than Chief, chief Axel now. And the same I felt that way from Chief Finney on. 
because Chief Finney said to us, you're going to have to make me do it. Well, there were some things we made him do, and he was willing to do it, but we had to do the work. So I am just pleased uh, that we're able to have this, and this is part of the mediated agreement also, that there is an annual review so we can look at what the process of the how the process has ran for the commissioner. And I know now, since this is new, new, this is new, we don't have anything to assess, but we will. And that's what it's really all about, so we can know if things are working or not. And if they're not, not working, we're here to help fix them, one way or the other. That's the motto we have. We try to do it the peaceful way, but if we can't do it the peaceful way, we're also warriors. The warrior ain't died yet. She's still alive, and so is the community. But I just want to say that this has been a wonderful experience, and when we started, I didn't know where we were going. But it's nice to know that we have now gotten here, and I know it's going to get better and better all the time. And St. Paul did a landmark, um, they made a, a, a landmark statement in the mediated agreement that everybody talks, in civil rights, that everybody talk about all over the country. And so I got to say for my city that this is really and truly a great place to live. And uh, I just, uh, I'm going to be looking and see what the commission is doing. We also have a meeting with uh, HERO uh, regarding any issues that may come up uh, around complaints of those kind of things that we need to do. We do that quarterly. We also have a quarterly meeting with this police and his uh, commanders. And we talk about what's happening in the community, what needs to be repaired. Sometimes it's just as simple as we have some aggressive parking meter, uh, people giving out parking tickets all the time when we don't have a whole lot of places to park. And we just ask, have a little common sense. If there's a snowstorm and you can't move, then do you need to be told or do you need to, those things need to happen. And I can say that in the past years, we've been able to negotiate and work those things out. So I am um, quite pleased with our partners. And I don't know who I turned this off to, but I'm done. <laughs> All right, that was great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Diane. So um, I will just flip through these next slides. Um, Diane basically covered them. Oh, Jonathan says it's coming back. Uh, <laughs> so um, I think a lot of you who are in the audience were around for the ordinance changes, and they're all listed on our website, and this PowerPoint will be there tomorrow as well. So um, I won't go through these in depth, but you can kind of see some of the bolded changes were some of the bigger ones that happened with the ordinance change. Um, and let me just get to... So um, in 2017, um, this year, uh, as Jesse mentioned, the ordinance took effect, and then I was hired. Um, my name's Libby Kantner, for those of you who don't know me. I'm the uh, review coordinator for the Civilian Review Board. Um, I will be saying that instead of the Police Civilian Internal Affairs Review Commission, because that's a mouthful. So I'll just say Review Commission. Um, so I was hired in uh, May, and then um, our new commissioners were appointed in August and seated in September, and they just began um, a case review in October. So this process that you're going to learn about tonight is um, still very new, and we're really excited to share it with you and hear what kind of feedback you guys have and questions so we can make it more clear and more transparent. Um, so as Diane mentioned, this annual summit is something that was required in uh, the mediated agreement back in 2001, um, but also put into the ordinance in the ordinance changes. So we're required to have this annual summit every year and review the previous year's annual report. So if you guys are interested in some fun reading material, the 2016 uh, annual report is at the hero table in the back and also online. Um, but I will just be quick, quickly walking through some of the uh, data highlights. 
Um, and again, this will be online um, tomorrow if you want to look at it in more depth. So in 2016, um, the PCARC, uh, or the Civilian Review Board, had nine meetings. At those nine meetings, they reviewed 47 different cases. Um, and each case can have multiple allegations attached to it. So, um, for example, a complaint could say, you know, not only did the officer not follow policy, but he also discriminated against me. So that would be two allegations. So of the 47 cases that were reviewed in 2016, there was 56 allegations. 10 of those were related to excessive force, and 46 were non-force related. Um, and then each case can also include multiple officers. So if you've ever had to call the police in St. Paul, you probably know that often more than, more than just one officer responds. So it's not uncommon to have multiple officers um, connected with, with each case. Another role of uh, the commission is they review um, discharge of firearms. So in 2016, they reviewed 16 discharges of firearms. So this uh, kind of breaks down the allegations a little bit more. So here are the different um, types of allegations that the commission sees. So uh, poor public relations, that would be something like swearing. Um, improper procedure, that would be um, not following something that's in policy. So for example, um, not filing a police report when it's required to do so. Um, improper conduct, that would be more along the lines of behavior. Um, excessive force, I think you can imagine what that would be, and then discrimination. So as you can see, improper procedure was the largest uh, allegation that they saw in 2016. Um, so we are gonna talk more about dispositions in a little bit, but um, the commission um, has the ability to recommend a disposition for each case that they see. And here's kind of the five different choices that they have. So unfounded, um, the allegation was either false or not factual, um, exonerated, so the incident did happen, but it was lawful um, and proper, not sustained, so there wasn't evidence to really say whether it happened or not. That's more of like a he said, she said situation. Um, sustained, so the allegation is supported with uh, evidence. Um, and then policy failure, so the allegation is factual, the officer followed proper department procedure, but the procedure had a problem with it. Um, so then we kind of break down the different dispositions that were recommended um, in 2016. As you can see, the majority were not sustained with 40 of those, um, and then sustained, unfounded, um, exonerated, and other. Um, and then we also break it down by allegation. I'm not gonna kind of talk through this, but again, it will be on the website tomorrow if, if you guys wanna dig into the bar graph. Um, another thing that we track is when the chief has varied from the commission's recommendations. So in 2016, he varied four, oops, sorry. He varied four times. Um, one from not sustained to sustained, one from no action to sustained, one from sustained to not sustained, and then one from exonerated. So um, what happened was uh, occurred, but was lawful and proper to sustain. So it was not lawful and proper. So, um, and then in 2016, they reviewed um, firearms discharges. There was nine justified with an animal. So for example, you know, a lot of time if a deer is hurt, officers come and and take care of them, um, four with people, and two um, accidental that did not involve humans or people. And the 2017 annual report will be ready in just a couple months. So we're already hard at work at that and very excited to bring that data back to you guys. Um, so now I'm gonna shift gears and kinda actually start talking about the process that we have. So. Um, the life of the complaint. So as you can see, it's a multi-step process. Um, so I'm gonna walk it, you through it with the help of um, our internal affairs uh, staff, Senior Commander Thomaser. Um, but basically, it starts with a complaint. What is a complaint? Um, so if you look on our website, um, you can see uh, the complaint form, and it has a ton of questions. Um, you know, were there witnesses? What's your email address? All this stuff is super helpful information um, 
to help internal affairs do a thorough evaluation and investigation, but it's not necessary. So to make a formal complaint, you need a, a statement of the incident, so what happened, and then you need to sign it. Um, so Minnesota state law forbids anonymous complaints, so um, all, all complaints do need to be signed with your legal name. So it's pretty simple. You're welcome to give more information, but um, it's, it's a simple process. So you can file a complaint um, in person with me um, at our Human Rights Department, or we have a full list of other places you can file complaints on our website. Um, you can also file them online or by mail. And then if you do need special accommodations, uh, you can't get to our office, but you need, you need help, um, you can contact me and, and we'll work something out. So uh, when dealing with complaints, um, there's just a few things to keep in mind. So who can complain? Anybody. Um, so uh, you don't have to be a certain age. Um, you don't have to live in the city of St. Paul. You can live anywhere. Um, your income, your criminal record, and your immigration status, none of those have an impact. Um, but for our process, you do need to complain about a St. Paul Police Department officer. So it needs to be a sworn personnel. So if you want to complain about you know, the non-sworn secretary in the St. Paul Police Department, you can't use our process. You can complain about them, but not through this. If you want to complain about me, definitely can, not the place. <laughs> So, um, and there's actually no statute of limitations on complaints. So, you know, something happened six years ago, you can still file the complaint. It's just might be harder to investigate. Um, and the officer's employment status may have changed. So why make a complaint? Um, it's because it is your right. Um, so I put, I put this slide in there because I want to you know, encourage everybody if they've experienced treatment that they don't um, think is to the standard they deserve from our police department, I want them to make a complaint. But, and not to say but, but I want to set reasonable expectations about what this process looks like. So it's not a criminal uh, litigation and it's not a civil litigation. You know, with a civil litigation, you know, maybe you're gonna get some money back or you're gonna kind of see the whole case file. This is an employment issue, um, and with that becomes, comes a lot of private data. So big changes, not just about a certain officer, but about a whole department can happen from you filing a complaint, but a lot of that is private. And so you won't hear a ton throughout the process, um, and even when it's over, there's not a ton that is privy to the public. So I, I, I encourage everyone to file complaints if they have them, but I just wanted to put that caveat and set expectations appropriately. So with that, I, um, after we get the complaint, we send it over to Internal Affairs, who does their review and investigation. So I will bring up Senior Commander Thomas or no. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rob Thomas or I'm a Senior Commander with the St. Paul Police Department, and I uh, serve as the Chief of Staff for for Chief Todd Axtell, and one of my collateral duties is to oversee the Internal Affairs Unit. And uh, I'd like to start by saying thank you to Reverend Miller for hosting us this evening. And I'd like to especially thank Director Kingston, Director or Deputy Director Martin, and Libby Katner and their staff for getting everybody together because this is an important discussion, a very important dialogue, and I know one that Chief Axtell uh, supports uh, entirely. And so um, I'm glad we're here having the discussion tonight, and uh, I look forward to uh, maybe connecting with some of you in the back later and answering some questions that you may have. Uh, I have a PowerPoint. Oh, if he was going to put it up, I definitely don't want to see me up there. <laughs> Let's cover that spot right there. While they're, uh, while they're doing that, my job tonight is just to give you a little bit of an overview of the uh, Internal Affairs Unit and what is our role in the entire process. And our, and our role... Uh, really boils down to uh, we're, we're the investigative entity for the department and for the commission and for the city when it comes to behavior involving uh, employees within the this, St. This Paul Police Department. Uh, Libby did a fantastic job in her presentation, and I just wanted to point out something. If you do have uh, a concern about a civilian employee and want to make a complaint, although you can't do that through the, the HERO 
website, you can make a complaint directly with the department and internal affairs will also investigate those complaints against civilian employees. So uh, just because uh, a person doesn't wear a, a badge or carry a gun doesn't mean you can't make a complaint about an employee. And I think Libby was, was right on the money when she, when she asked the question, which I think is the most important question, is, is why make a complaint? And the reality is, is Chief Axtell has pledged to the people that we serve that we will provide trusted service with respect every day without exception. And the way we do that is by gathering and getting feedback from those we provide service to. And if that is, uh, rises to the level of a formal complaint, uh, that's how we'll look at that or, or uh, investigate that. If you just give us uh, feedback on our department survey, we would love to hear from you as to how we're doing so that we can make improvements so that we know that we're doing the best possible job that we can to provide us police service to the people that live, work, and, and visit St. Paul. So I'll move on to my, my PowerPoint. All right, so just to give you a little bit of background, the, the Internal Affairs Unit reports directly to the chief. There's no layers of insulation between the, the unit and the chief. He gets a direct report from me on a regular basis, and he knows exactly what's going on, what's open, and, and what's, uh, what's been going on in the department. He is, uh, he's very involved in understanding what's, uh, what's the uh, uh, open caseload and what are the natures of the complaints that we're looking at. Uh, one of the things we do besides investigate complaints, we also review critical incidents. And a critical incident is any time a police officer is involved in some sort of action and interacts with somebody else, and that interaction results in their serious injury or, or possibly their death. And when that happens, there's a lot of times a criminal review that occurs that is done by the county attorney's office uh, or whoever the, the case is referred to. And once that process is done, the case will come to internal affairs, and then we'll give it a second look and review it based on policy. So if you think that the county attorney's role is to look at it for a lawful action, we'll look at it to make sure that the actions that were taken were within policy and to the standard that, that we prescribe. Uh, we also have a couple of administrative functions. The department has a, a, a use force tracking system. We, we, we monitor that. We also uh, monitor the, uh, all the reporting, mandatory reporting that happens with any officer that carries a, a, an ECD, which is uh, the, the abbreviation for what we call a taser. Uh, so who, who makes complaints and where do we get them from? So a lot of the complaints that we have and we investigate are generated internally. Supervisors around the department will see conduct or, or learn of conduct to someone that's within their command and they'll make a complaint referred up to internal affairs and sometimes we'll investigate it, sometimes it'll get investigated in the, in the command in which generated the complaint. We'll also investigate complaints that come from uh, community members, people who pick up the phone and call us or go through the, the uh, other complaint uh, sites in the, in the community where you, where you can make a complaint. Uh, we'll also uh, get complaints from formalized organizations. Uh, the NWCP is one, for example. HERO is one, for example. We have a, a different uh, site or community sites in the community. Um, Neighborhood Justice Center is another one that comes to mind where people can go, not have to walk into the police department, not have to interact with, with, with people maybe that they're, they're uncomfortable with at the time, and they can facilitate a complaint which will get to us, which we'll investigate, and which ultimately will get to the commission at some point. The, uh, the, when a person does make a complaint, my job is to review that complaint and determine whether or not we'll investigate it. And that seems like a big red flag. Whoa, wait a second. What, what do you mean maybe you, you will or won't investigate that? Uh, there are times where, where I'll look at a complaint and I'll learn that it doesn't involve an employee that works for our department, and that's something that I don't have the jurisdiction then to investigate. Uh, you'd be happy to know, though, that I don't just uh, throw it in the trash or do nothing with it. I, I figure out where the jurisdiction is, uh, my team does, and we send a letter to the person who made the complaint and, and give them the contact information for the right department. We also take it one step further and we'll give a a notice, to, we'll copy the department of the complaint so that their internal affairs or their investigative body knows that that complaint was referred to us so that we can get it in the right hands. Our, our job is not to ever give anybody the run around if we can provide service, even if that service isn't within our scope to investigate it ourselves, we'll, we'll always do that. Once, uh, once I get the complaint and, and know that we're gonna investigate it, I will then classify it. And you saw Libby's slide about all the breakdowns of, of how the commission looked at cases and what categories they fall in. That's my job to classify those. And it's really more of an art than a science because if you consider 
uh, a person's narrative of, of what they're describing took place that, that wasn't to their standard. As I go through that, sometimes it'll cross a couple of lines and it's not completely clear and, and the commissioners know this and they're, they're working through this with us, but we try to classify it as best that we can based on some, some generalizations of those classifications with which uh, Libby did a very good job of, of sharing with you. Once we get them into those classifications, then, uh, then the case is assigned to somebody to investigate. Uh, a lot of times those cases are investigated by internal affairs. All the serious cases, uh, more serious cases are investigated by internal affairs. There are some cases though that we will refer back to the command to do their own investigation of the employees within their command. Sometimes there's some specialty um, uh, questions to be answered regarding the, the type of investigation, if it's a specialized investigation, such as uh, domestic violence or, or sex crimes or something of that nature. So we tried to find the best uh, entity to, to review the complaint and try to get the investigation done and done um, judiciously and as quickly as possible. Uh, when we follow a complaint or, or when we investigate a complaint, we have to follow certain rules that, that are given to us. Uh, most predominantly that you probably have heard about and it's been written about in the paper and, and it's, it's, it's kind of our, our governing state law is the Minnesota Disciplinary Procedures Act. It's just one rule that we follow. It's, there's civil service rules that we follow. We have uh, uh, department contracts. We have other things that, we, that, that guide us in how we do our job. But most of all, we, we have to work within the confines of, of 626.89, which is the, the Police Officers Disciplinary Procedures Act. And that is... Uh, has these requirements, I won't read them to you, I'll let you read them, but it's kind of came down to what Libby was talking to you about before. You have to provide us with a little bit of information about what you know, and you just, you have to sign it. And once that happens, it puts some restrictions on me of how I have to conduct the investigation. If I want to compel an interview from an employee, I have to tape record that interview. If I, if I uh, uh, am going to interview an employee or get a statement from an employee, written or otherwise, uh, that employee is entitled to union representation or legal representation, depending on the case. So uh, I don't want to go too fast. I know those words are kind of small, but I'll just leave it up there for just a couple of seconds. Uh, my job really is to, uh, my team is to gather evidence and create a case file that is objective, that is uh, containing all the facts that are available about that incident relative to the complaint, and, and it's complete enough that if the commission first and then the chief agrees and a discipline is assigned, that that case file can be used in an employment action and gets the employee involved. And that's really what, what my job comes down. I don't, I don't judge the behavior, it's not my role. My role is to be the fact finder and, and whatnot. So I'm gonna move on from this slide. There's a, there's a big question all the time about, uh, you know, what what officers have rights to do and what they don't have to do. And, and one of the things I just wanted to point out is, is there's, a, there's a difference between a criminal investigation and an employment investigation. And I don't think everybody knows this, but what's important to, 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 dis, to distinguish between the two is, if I wanna to speak to an employee about conduct uh, for an employment matter, they can't tell me no without it being a violation of policy. A person doesn't have to give a, a statement criminally under the, the, the Fifth Amendment. It's, it's a due process right that's afforded to them. Under employment law, it's not. If, if I want to speak to you about an incident, uh, I will give you this warning and, and I can compel that statement so that we can investigate the complaint and learn more about the, the case. A person could choose not to do it. I've not seen it happen, but a person could choose not to do it. And if they do, then they are violating their, their terms of their employment. And they, they are subject to then discipline for just that act itself. So there's a, there's a big difference in the, uh, the criminal versus the, um, the employment, uh, employment investigations. Uh, Libby has a slide that kind of touches on all of this, and so I won't go through it. It just kind of gets us to the middle of where I'm going. And, and again, if you remember, the complaint comes in. It, it uh, is evaluated, it's assigned, and once it's assigned and it's, it comes out, then we get into what do we do? What happens with internal affairs? What do they do to put a case file together? And really, again, as what I said before, we are fact finders, and our job is to make sure if evidence exists to, to connect to the incident in which you or someone you know is reporting, we're gonna find it, and we're gonna categorize it, and we're gonna put it in the case file. And what could that be? That could be statements from from the people who were involved, the person who made the complaint, that could be people who maybe witnessed it, who aren't departmental employees. That could be 
That could be uh, interviews and witnesses, statements from people who are employees. One of the things that I do when I categorize complaints is I look at them and I determine is, am I the principal actor in this that is going to be uh, reviewed for policy violations or other violations, or am I a witness to this event? And you'll be classified there. And under, and under uh, either of those classifications, we could ask and compel you to make a statement as a witness or as a, a subject of that complaint. But once, we're going to, once we figure that out, we're going to talk to everybody involved that we can. Internal Affairs also has access to every data set and videotape and audio source that exists in the department. We can access everything that the department has. So body-worn camera, in-car camera, uh, MDT messages, emails, uh, you name it, we have access to it. We can get access to all the city camera systems. We, we have access to uh, the GPS trackers in car and our radio cars. We have all that stuff at our disposal. And anything that seems to be relevant to the complaint that we have in front of us, we're going to touch on those data systems and we're going to bring them in and we're going to catalog them so that those who are responsible for reviewing the complaint will do that. And that would be the, the commissioners and then the administration of the department, most specifically the chief. We do criminal or uh, employment investigations much like you would conduct a criminal investigation. In fact, the investigators that do these uh, internal uh, employee investigations are criminal investigators. That's where they come from. They do, they've done those cases. They know how to bring cases to a, a jury. They know how to win those cases. And again, our job is to make sure that we've collected an objective and complete file so that once the department makes a decision, if it leads to a disciplinary action, that this case would win in that disciplinary action. That's, that's our goal. There are, there are things that an arbitrator will look for if the case is taken to, to a grievance, which an employee is entitled to, which is way down the road and I don't want to get off track, but the employee will look for completeness as one of the elements as is it fair to the employee. If it's, if it's not complete, they don't see that as fair. So that's sort of the, the, the uh, methodology in which we conduct our investigations. And again, our job is to be thorough and to be complete. And there are times where, where the investigator will get done with the investigation uh, every time it comes to me. And there are times where I'll send it back and, and request more. Once I'm done with it, then it's reviewed for, by the commissioners. And there are times that the commissioners will look, for it, look at it and ask for more. And sometimes it will go to the chief. And there's sometimes the chief will look at it and ask for more. Those instances are pretty rare. A lot, of, a lot of times at my level, they're sent back, but once it gets past that, it's, it's usually a pretty solid case that the city can rely on to hold an employee account, accountable in an employment action should it need to. Once the, uh, the case is done, the, the case is gonna have a recommendation attached to it. And this is a process that I won't go past my role, but this is what, uh, this is sort of the end of a complaint. And Libby talked about this a little bit ago, and it's, it's the way we close them out. And it's a very standardized system, much like the classification system. Uh, again, uh, it's, it's kind of an art, not a science, but this is a little bit more technical than, than the classification process because it's a little bit more cut and dry. But this is what you'll see. And when you look at Libby's slides about how cases are closed out, are closed out this is the, the classifications that you'll find. Uh, there's no deviation from this, and if you were to go to the St. Paul Police Department and ask for Rob Thomas's internal affairs card, my investigations, my internal affairs card would have these classifications on it. And I know there's at least one person in the room that's done that. I'm just having fun with it. Come on. Uh, anyways, I'm trying to lighten up here. Uh, so that's a. Uh, that's uh, the, sort of the course of the, the internal affairs role. One of the things I want to make clear is, is internal affairs doesn't do criminal investigations. If, a, if a, an officer or other employee is subject to a criminal investigation, that's handled by somebody outside the department. We don't handle our own uh, internal, or we don't handle our own criminal investigations. If, a, let's say, an employee is, is uh, stopped in, in St. Paul for, for driving under the influence, we won't investigate that. Our criminal people won't investigate that, and our internal affairs uh, people don't handle the criminal investigation. Uh, the other thing we don't do is we often don't uh, conduct a parallel criminal uh, investigation into a, a complaint when there's a criminal action going on. And, and the reason for this is, is a person who has been charged with a crime is afforded certain constitutional rights. And one of them is not to self-incriminate. And if we were to conduct a parallel investigation while that criminal case is going on, 
there's a chance where that person in, in giving a statement to internal affairs would give us information that the court could actually use against them in a criminal hearing. And what we don't want to do is subject somebody to that. We don't want to trick anybody. We don't want to use uh, the complaint to get information out of them that we can use to convict them later. That's not what we do. We want to be very careful to make sure that people who make complaints are protected from the system. They probably don't understand the system as closely as we do. So we try to be that gatekeeper to make sure that we're looking out for their rights on that, on that front. So sometimes, uh, and it happens a lot where someone will write uh, in a complaint and they'll say, hey, I was, I was uh, stopped illegally and given a, a speeding ticket. And they want to say I, their whole reason for the stop was speeding and I wasn't speeding. That's not a case that we would really uh, work through the internal affairs process. That's a matter for the court to decide. And what we'll do is, is have communications with the person making the complaint to help them understand that. Sometimes these people also... Uh, represented by attorneys, will have that conversation with their attorneys so their attorney understands what we're trying to explain so that those folks who maybe have had a bad incident in their life and also want to make or bring to, to the light conduct of the officers don't end up uh, giving up rights on one side to, uh, to carry out or, or, or invoke a right on the other side. So we're very careful about trying to protect folks in that regard. Uh, when a, complaint, when a case is done, I mentioned in the very beginning that sometimes complaints are internal and sometimes they're external. And if, if I generate an internal complaint because I learn a, a police officer missed court, and the question is, is did they go to court? Were they served their subpoena? Were, did they fulfill the obligations? That's a case that's going to go directly to the chief and not to the commission. Uh, if the complaints are generated externally, if anyone from... The, any of the, the external sites that were on the slide from earlier generate a complaint for the department, all those cases are going to go to the PCR. And uh, that's, a, that's a policy that we just do not deviate from. Uh, I'm going to be, uh, I don't know if you're going to talk about this one or you want me to? So if, if a complaint is sustained and a, com and a complaint uh, has gone through the process and gets to the chief, the chief can have assign a number of different remedies to that or outcomes to that investigation. And these are what those are. Uh, it can be anywhere from uh, just a supervisor interacting and, and counseling the employee and saying, hey, this is how you do better next time, all the way to termination. And these are um, not considered public until they all grievance processes have been exhausted. So if the PCR says, hey, Rob did something wrong, and he's gonna, we suggest he gets this discipline, and the chief says, yes, I agree. It doesn't become public until I've, if I choose to take it to a grievance process, which is afforded by contract. Once that process is all exhausted and the case is final, then all internal affairs complaints that are uh, sustained with discipline are accessible to the public. If they are not sustained, then uh, that's not uh, public to the, or, or it, it would be on their card that an investigation occurred, but it would be closed with no discipline. So, uh, it's, so this is all data practices law. It's not something that we uh, invented or, or, or um, uh, try to, to enforce. It's, it's the data practices law, which we try to follow to the letter. And I, uh, I got my two minute warning sign, so I'm just gonna kinda kind of hurry here. Uh, I think I've kind of touched on, on most of this stuff. Uh, that's just more data practices stuff. And I think that's it. I'm going to stand in the back of the room at the end of the night and I have a pocket full of business cards. I'm happy to visit with anybody tonight and, and answer questions or provide more information about the internal affairs process. Again, as I said in the very beginning, the public role in helping the police department understand how we do and how well we're doing is, is critical for our success. And if you ever are sitting around thinking, ah, I should say something, but nah, maybe I just won't because they're too busy, we're not. We want to hear from you. We want to know how we're doing. And if it rises to the level of internal affairs complaint, I hope you learned tonight all the different ways in which you can make that complaint. If it's uh, some, just more feedback about the department, please consider using our, our department survey. Uh, every one of those survey submissions are reviewed. If you say you want to be contacted, you will be contacted. 
and uh, allow those to lead to uh, either corrective action or discipline, or not discipline, I'm sorry, but different, different conversations within the department so that we can be better and we can be that 21st century world-class police department committed to excellence. So I thank you for your time tonight and I look forward to meeting you someone in the back tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm being told, sir, that, that there's, there's no room in the agenda, but I'll, but I'll, but I'll visit with you after the, the no, thing tonight. Thank, thank you very much, and, and Mr. Newmeister, I'll talk to you in back. I'm, I'm, I'm getting the hook. I hear the music. Thanks. Thank you, Senior Commander. Uh, I see a few familiar faces in the, the audience tonight, for, but for those that don't know me, my name is Brian Langford, and I am the Commission Chair uh, I have the distinct honor and privilege of not only leading the commission, but I'll, oh, sorry, I should take this with me. Not only leading the commission, but also uh, the wonderful commissioners that are seated here in the front row that you will meet later this evening. Uh, what's going on here? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just kind of walk you through the process of what happens at the actual uh, meeting itself. Um, Basically, two weeks prior to the meeting, we get the commission, or we get the files rather, uh, on laptops that we can review prior to the meeting. We typically meet once per month, uh, usually the first Wednesday of the month, um, to um, basically decide not only uh, any disposition, but whether or not we have any recommended disciplinary uh, recommendations to the chief. Um, one of the things that's changed for 2017 versus 2016 by way of the ordinance as you'll see the second bullet point there is we now have two sections to the meeting there's a public portion and there's also the private portion which is where, where we actually do the deliberation of the case itself which I'll get into that in a little more detail later um, but that's one of the the changes that has occurred um, and then of course we've got uh, or we have representatives not only from HERO but also internal affairs uh, human rights as well that are there to uh, view the process. So uh, the first option, as I mentioned, um, sorry, what? Oh, oh, sorry, okay. Yeah, it's like, do you want me to lean down, slow down? Okay. Uh, so uh, one of the other things, in addition to now having a public and a private portion of the meeting, uh, we now also have the uh, ability ability for uh, complaints to come and provide testimony. Uh, so basically, like I said, we get the case. Uh, Internal Affairs will present the case, and uh, if there are any people or any complainants that would like to provide additional testimony, we allow them to come in one at a time and provide that testimony to the commission. Once that is completed. Uh, we then also check to see whether or not there are any officers who are there to provide basically their side or their, their testimony uh, for the case as well. And then finally, once that's completed, the case goes back to internal affairs uh, for uh, there may be a need to do an additional investigation. Uh, there may be some additional clarification that needs to occur. So we don't review any case where there's uh, testimony that night goes back to, to internal affairs. We get it at, a, at a, uh, a time later in the future and then review it again at that case. So um, that's the first option. And the second option, um, pretty clear, is what happens when we don't have testimony. So again, internal affairs um, presents the, the information. We do our deliberation, as uh, you've seen a couple times already. Uh, we've got the dispositions that we go through and then also uh, depending on, on how we, we vote the disposition, we may have a recommendation for uh, discipline. Um, and then, well, I kind of skipped ahead. I've gone through all three of those. But basically, we do our deliberation. If we've got uh, a recommendation, then we, then we will 
uh, at that point decide that an additional level of discipline is necessary if we so decide. Um, the one thing that I do want to mention, um, we, we operate under the rule of a simple majority. We don't have to have a unanimous decision for either the dispositions or the discipline. Um, we've got a nine member panel. So, you know, if five vote one way and four vote the other way, the motion passes, you know, regardless of, of you know, the conversation that's occurred or how people may feel. Again, we, we, we work on or work under the premise of a simple majority. So uh, we don't need to have unanimous consensus. Yeah, okay, we've seen this slide at, at least three times, or this, this maybe this is the third time. But again, th these are the, the dispositions that, that we have available to us. Um, and again, I'm not gonna go through these again. You've already seen this information a couple, two, three times. Um, but again, we, we first make the disposition. And if we do decide that uh, if we basically go with sustain, which basically means that we found that the complaint that was filed uh, was valid sustain, there's, there's evidence to, to keep that uh, uh, complaint or sustain that complaint, then we basically get into the disciplinary action. And Senior Commander touched on, on these um, briefly. Uh, and again, I'm not gonna, not gonna read all of them um, to you, but these are the disciplinary actions that we have available to us um, that depending on the nature of the case and, and the conversation that we've had, the discussion that we've had, we will make a recommendation for discipline as well. And again, just like with the dispositions, disciplinary is also on a simple majority. So again, if we've got five that vote one way and four that vote another way, the motion passes, so. Was I gonna do this or were you gonna do this? Do you want me to do this? Okay, so then after we um, make our recommendation, the decision then goes to the chief, uh, where he's got the opportunity to then review uh, not only the case, but, but our recommendation. And at that point, he's got, or he has, uh, the opportunity to either agree with the decision that we made or uh, he can modify uh, the, the decision. He can either suggest more discipline or less discipline. And in those particular cases, as you can see, uh, he will then write a letter that goes back to um, Libby, the, the uh, coordinator, and then they'll notify me and then have a conversation with the chief um, to basically determine why he decided to go in a different direction than what the commission decided. Um, as a matter of coincidence, I had lunch with the chief yesterday. Uh, we, we actually talked about this. We're gonna uh, certainly be uh, more in communication with each other just to make sure that, because you know, basically uh, what I wanna make sure as the chair is that, you know, that we're doing what we need to do and that we are analyzing the cases in such a way so that you know, we're not getting a bunch of the cases returned or, or we're not, we're not uh, basically, uh, agreeing, or the chief is not agreeing with the dispositions that we're recommending. Um, it doesn't happen often, it does happen, um, but I just wanna make sure that, you know, we've got that open communication and that we are, uh, in essence, being as effective as we can as commissioners and as a commission, because, you know, we're not only serving uh, the public, but also uh, the police as well. We wanna make sure that we're doing our job to the best of our ability, so. And with that, now you're gonna take it from me. So, thank you. Thank you, Chair Langford. Can we just get a brief round of applause for the chair, our fearless leader? Um, and then I can just click through these really quickly. Um, Rob kind of touched on them, but um, the chief makes the final decision um, on all complaints, and then there are sometimes labor processes, um, so grievances and that sort of thing. And then the complaint is closed. Um, and as Rob mentioned, if it's sustained and there is discipline, um, then that is public. Um, but otherwise, it's closed with no discipline. So the complainant at the end of all that will get a letter um, with that information. So now it is uh, my Great pleasure to introduce our new commissioners to you all. Um, They're some of the most talented people I have had the pleasure of working with in my life. Um, so uh, do you guys want to all just come stand up here and we'll just go, to, go down the line? 
Hello? Good evening, and thanks to everyone for coming out. My name is Constance Tuck. Um, I am the vice chair, and so I'll be working closely and have been working closely with Libby and with Chair Langford um, in terms of finalizing the decisions that come out of the commission. I live in Ward 3 um, over in the Highland area. I've been in St. Paul for 21, almost 22 years now. I still don't feel that I'm really a native because I know that's, <laughs> that's something for Minnesota, but, um, but I, I retired a little over a year ago and wanted to make sure that I continued to offer service to the community and I couldn't think of a better way to do this. This is really important work and um, I'm looking forward to my continued working on the commission. So I'm not sure which way I should pass it, but pass it back. Good evening, everyone, excuse me. I'm Sasha Cotton. I'm also a newly appointed commissioner. I live in Ward 1 and in the Western District of the Police Department. Um, Professionally, I work for the city of Minneapolis doing violence prevention coordination. Um, so looking at a variety of public safety initiatives and bringing the community's perspective. I'm a lifelong resident of St. Paul and Ward 1, um, a third generation um, resident of St. Paul. Very proud of that legacy and those roots. Um, and yeah, I'm a Rondo baby for sure. I heard someone say that in the back. Yeah, I'm a Rondo baby. Um, I'm a mom. I have raised an 18 year old in the cities. Um, so proud to be a part of this work. I think it's really important work. I'm also an active member and the vice chair of the African American Leadership Council of St. Paul. My name is Daria Caldwell, I'm also newly appointed to the commission. I am a five year resident of St. Paul. I am currently in a physical education teacher at Highland Park Elementary and a doctoral candidate at Hamlin University for educational leadership. Um, what else? That's it. <laughs> Hello, my name is Kristen Clark. I live in Hamlin Midway, Ward 4. Uh, professionally, I am an, an attorney during the day. Um, I moved here from Tennessee, and so I'm getting to learn uh, more about the community, and so I thought that it would be great to actually participate on a commission and let uh, the public's voices be heard. Hi, my name is Rick Heidinger. The reason I was pointing at, pointing at Brian is I'm not yet a commissioner. I have uh, been voted in by the city council, but I'll take over a position that's opened on January 1st. Brian guarantees me that unless I do something stupid tonight, I'll be okay. Uh, I live in Ward 2 over on Goodrich Avenue, uh, not too far from Grand and, and uh, uh, Victoria. That's where I've lived for 39 years, I guess. Uh, before that, I was in Iowa and Illinois, so I'm not a native of Minnesota, although I've been here many more years of my life than anywhere else. Uh, I've been quite involved in the St. Paul community. I do not have a full-time job. I'm retired, but I've been involved in a number of city things. Um, I helped found Frogtown Farm, for example, over in Frogtown. I'm involved with an organization called Ujamaa Place, uh, which is for young African-American males. My sort of passion is trying to build bridges, if you will, between different groups, whether they be socioeconomic groups, whether they be cultural groups, or whatever. Uh, I've had a long time fascination with policing. Uh, I haven't followed it carefully, but I think it's one of the most complicated jobs in the world, uh, where the most qualified professionals need to make snap judgments. Uh, with just the greatest of ease, if you will. Um, and so I've been really uh, very happy to be chosen for this position. I'm looking forward to it with a great deal of seriousness and responsibility, and I'm learning. So if you join me at, at Ward 2, where I'll be sitting at that table, you're gonna find that I'm the not yet uh, rookie. I have not been to any closed meetings where they decided cases, so I may really punt a number of the questions you have, but I'm really gonna be here to listen to see what you've got to say. So thank you. Hello again, uh, Brian Langford, uh, longtime resident of the east side of St. Paul, live over by Lake Phelan. 
Uh, as Rick mentioned, he will be coming in starting in January. We have a uh, commissioner who has, for lack of a better term, aged out. She's basically served her maximum number of, of terms with the commission, which is six years, by the way. Um, and so once that happens, I will then become the elder statesman. I've been with the commission for a year and a half, so I've, I've gone through the transition of the I'll call it the former commission and the former rules and now part of the new commission with the new rules. Um, and it's kind of funny saying elder statesman considering that I will be the youngest commissioner on the commission. <laughs> <laughs> right, but there's, there's humor there. Um, but again, I'm, you know, again, I, I'm uh, very honored, like I said earlier, to serve as the chair. Uh, we have a, a very wonderful and spirited uh, body of commissioners here. The meetings are not boring, I will tell you that. Um, and again, I just look forward to working with everybody um, as we move forward and, and just work through the process. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kali Herr, and I live in Ward 1. Um, I am the former uh, St. Paul Public Schools Board Administrator, but currently right now I'm focusing on my doctorate at University of St. Thomas. and. Um, my family has long roots in the Frogtown neighborhood, um, and I'm excited to be a part of this commission and doing my part as a community member. Thank you for being here tonight. Hi, my name is Rachel Sullivan Nightingale. I live in St. Paul's North End, and um, I came to St. Paul in the 90s for grad school, and that is where we've decided to raise our family and settle down long term. My professional background is in advising university students who study abroad, and prior to that, I taught English to speakers of other languages. And I am looking forward to serving on this commission as part of building a healthy and safe community for everyone, not only as an individual resident, but also being able to contribute in the institutions that serve our community. All right, can we get a round of applause for the commissioners?